Welcome, Illumineers. I'm your host, Rush, here to help you explore the news, meta, and more of the realm of Lorcana. Let's get into it. All right, Illumineers, today we're going to be taking a look at Steel. Steel, in my opinion, is probably one of the most versatile of the ink colors that we currently have. Now, we can start off with the fact that it has been seeing a exceedingly high representation compared to where we were at the beginning of the expansion. Now, we can start off with the fact that it has card draw, it has direct damage, it has spread damage, it has great shiftable targets, it has incredible keywords. Let's go ahead and get into the cards. We can start off with two drop Inkable Aladdin. It has two strength, one willpower, two lore generation, a fairly average card based on its stats, there's a couple comparable and other ink colors that see a little bit of play. In Steel, we do not see it represented very much, but I think when the next set comes out, we're going to be seeing a little bit more play because I feel Steel, Ruby, Aggro will become a little bit more of a thing. And it's going to be still a great shiftable target for Ruby Aladdin. So I'm going to set it right here in the B tier currently, but I do think this might move up to A when it becomes a decent shiftable target for Ruby. But Ruby Steel right now isn't, isn't very popular. Let's go into Beast. At the beginning of the first chapter, Beast was not played very much, but with the more Ruby and Amethyst play that we see in things like Mirror and in the Steel matchup, Beast Mirror and Magic Mirror out of Amethyst, um, C play and Fishborn Quill and Sapphire. Beast has been run more of a two to three, sometimes even four uh, copies in a lot of decks. I think Beast is a solid A tier card, mainly based on the fact that it's decent power or it's decent strength of four, it's decent willpower of four, and two lore generation for a five dot is a little bit underwhelming, but it's some of the only item removal we currently have in the game, if not the only item removal we have in the game. So it's making it kind of a staple right now in a lot of steel decks. For that reason alone, it's going to go into A. I think stat wise, though, it'll probably go into B as we get more item removal, but that's where it is currently. Oh, it is an inkable card, by the way. Four drop, uninkable, Captain Hook, Captain of the Jolly Roger. Three strength, four willpower, one lore generation. When you play this character, you may return an action card named Fire the Cannons from your discard pile to your hand. We see him played in a few decks. He's got all right stats. His main ability is the fact that you can play Fire the Cannons early game, play him on four to get them back and kind of recur them throughout the game. So he's basically a draw card style of effect. And with the fact that Fire the Cannons isn't inkable. I don't think it's the greatest thing in the world, but it's a nice way to throw around an extra one lore or uh, one ink you have on certain turns. So decent option. I think he's a B tier card. We might see a little bit more play out of him when more pirates come out, if there becomes a better pirate theme. But I would probably put him in the C tier right now. He's not seeing a lot of play. He's only in very specific decks. He is not a staple in any combination of ink colors that I have currently seen. Captain Hook, one drop. A one cost inkable card with one strength, two willpower, and one lore generation with uh, challenger um, two. This is a staple in every single steel deck there is pretty much four copies currently. While I don't think that he is statted as far as anything to be concerned as an A tier card, I think because he's one of the few options and he's inkable that you can play on one and end up taking down something like a Simba, I think he has to go into A currently. You'll see a lot of this in Steel compared to something like Sapphire that we just went over. Steel just has a lot of answers that no one currently has right now, which is its greatest strength. So Captain Hook is going to go straight into an A tier card just on the fact that he has he is a solvable solution to a lot of other cards. 
Captain Hook, five drop, uninkable. Captain uh, Captain Hook, thinking happy thoughts. This is a two strength, five willpower character, one lore generation with shift three, which is incredible, which means you can generally play him on three and sing with him off of Captain Hook, which is another reason I think he's really, really good right now and incredibly underrepresented. I honestly believe there should be at least two of these in song decks simply based on the fact that you can shift him on three and play a grab your swords on turn three. In incredible opportunity. Um, he has challenger three. He also has an ability where characters with cost three or less cannot challenge him. So he'll stick around for a little while. It, I, I can't underrepresent how strong this card actually is when played in the right way. You definitely don't want to run four of it, but something like two could be incredibly useful if you see in your opening hand. Do not sleep on this card. I honestly think it's an A-tier card and is very underrepresented. All right, let's move on to the three-headed dog. Five drop server, Cerberus, Inkable, three-headed dog, five strength, six willpower, one lore generation. Just a absolute staple. One of the few things in the game that takes him down is Maui. And if they waste a Maui on this, they're not wasting it on a Tink and other things of that nature. He has five strength out the gate on turn five, which is decent. Just all around solid. You don't generally see four of them, maybe a two of. And in bad matches, you will probably end up inking him. So just a decent option. I, th I think he's B tier all day, all day long. Donald Duck, the Musketeer. Four drop, inkable card, two strength, five willpower, one lord generation. He does have bodyguard. And during your turn, your musketeer characters gain evasive. He is incredibly good in a musketeer specific deck or even a bodyguard deck utilizing something like tavern, which we'll talk about later. Just a all around decent card, decent protector on turn four with his five willpower. He'll suck up a Maui hit so that no one else does, things of that nature. Yeah, all around decent. I do think he's a C tier card just because there's not a lot of meta right now. And he's just kind of the only option at his level for a bodyguard. All right, on to Gontu. Gontu is a eight drop character, inkable, six strength, six willpower, two lore generation. Characters with cost two or less cannot challenge your characters. The ability is decent for anti-aggro, but currently he's just not seeing any play because all around it's not that useful. This ability on a low drop would be far more incredible, but by turn eight, most of the time there's nothing that's really that threatening that is a one or two cost that wants to challenge you. Generally they're questing in aggro and heavy decks. So I think that's currently why this is one of the very, very few legendary cards that's under $5. I think it's like $4.20 at the time of filming this, filming this video. So yeah, I'm, I mean, unfortunately, it's a super, super <laughs> hard to get legendary card that everybody seems to have a billion of. And it's legendary. I, I don't understand what they thought when making this a legendary card, but that's what they did. I'm sure there's something that must have to do with other sets that may utilize this a little bit stronger, but I just can't currently see it in our current format. Well, next card, D tier. Um, Goons. Goons is a two drop, or sorry, one drop inkable card for two strength, two willpower, and uh, one lore generation. It is your standard stitch, flounder, and Archimedes from most color combinations. Oh, don't want to forget Sergeant Tibbs. Yeah, it's just a standard. It's nothing bad about it. It's decent stats, helps against anti-aggro. The only one of these cards that actually stands out, I believe is Stitch because it has a shiftable target. Other than that, they're all pretty much just B tier cards. They go in a lot of decks. Um, I don't think 
this saw much play until the Amethyst, sorry, Amber Steel Songs deck. And then we saw a lot more of it because they were looking for more one drops. But other than that, just kind of a solid B tier card. Hans, four drop, Inkable, 13th in the line, three strength, three willpower, two lore generation. Whenever this character quests, you may deal one damage to chosen character. This card has seen a lot more playability lately than it did when the first chapter came out. Everybody kind of avoided this card like the plague, like, oh, what are you gonna do with one damage? But then as they utilized Big Tink and Smash and Grab Your Swords more and more and more, we all kind of realized that one damage here and there was far more powerful than we thought it was. And that's what I think makes this another A tier card. It is an auto include in most steel decks that are not super low range. Mid or late game steel decks are going to run this card for extra damage spread. It's just, you can't not. Let's go on to Hercules, three drop, Inkable. True hero is a three strength, three willpower, one lord generation card. It has bodyguard is decently statted for a three drop bodyguard is just kind of a bonus but similar to donald duck i believe it is a c tier card until we get more support for bodyguards it's just not really there now that is the only stipulation to that is the fact that bodyguard has tabard which again we'll go over later like we will with donald duck which in a bodyguard specific deck could have some usefulness so yeah that's about it c tier until something else comes out three drop Kristoff, official ice master three strength three willpower inkable card or two lore it is Again, just a decently statted card. Nothing really special about it. It does go in steel aggro decks. That's about all she wrote. B tier card. Doesn't see a crazy amount of play because steel aggro is currently not super popular compared to steel songs and steel mid range. Crunk. Everybody's favorite Crunk. Six drop, inkable card, six strength, six willpower, two lore generation. If there were not so many good auto includes in steel comboed with another ink color right now, I think you might actually see a little bit of this card. But currently what he would be used for is what Cerberus is kind of used for right now, where you can play it on five because that's all you need because Cerberus is a five drop so he can sing things. Six really just isn't that useful right now because you have Tinkerbell and other options that are just kind of better. So unfortunately, he's just replaceable. I'm going to put him in D tier right now just because there's better options. Let's see. Lilo, the Galactic Hero. This is a three drop inkable card, four strength, two willpower, two lore generation. The four strength is interesting, but the fact that it dies to everything with its two willpower, I think just instantly makes it a D tier card. You swing a breeze at it after turn four and it dies. So let's move on D tier card. Big boy Maui Demigod is up next. Eight drop, inkable card, eight strength, eight willpower, three lore generation, with no ability whatsoever. This card just does not see play currently. I don't really think there's a reason to. Comparatively to other eight drops, he's just a pile of stats. A lot of them have three or better lore, but yeah, I think Mickey out of Ruby is four strength, eight willpower, and four lore generation. I think most people would rather have that. Eight strength, eight willpower doesn't really do a lot. 
in the late game. It just dies to a dragon fire. Well, that's about all I can say about that one. It's D tier. No one runs it in any deck ever. Mickey Mouse, Musketeer, two strength, seven willpower, six cost and is inkable with two lore generation. He has bodyguard and your other mus Musketeer characters get plus one strength. As far as Musketeers go, he's actually pretty good. Even not as a Musketeer, he's a decent six drop bodyguard if you need one. The problem is most decks right now don't really have a need for a six drop bodyguard. I think there might be options for him again if you do something bodyguard specific. But currently, there's only about two bodyguards in the game that are really worth it. One is two drop Simba for Amber. The other one is five drop Maximus out of Amber. Yeah, not looking the greatest right now for bodyguards unless you do a bodyguard specific deck with Tabard, which again, I'm gonna save all of that for when we hit Tabard here in a minute. And boy, do I have a lot to say about that one. Let's move on to Prince Eric. Prince Eric, dashing and brave, one strength, three willpower. He has a two cost and is inkable and one lore generation with Challenger 2. Now this card has a lot going for it as far as being a two cost character. He swings for three at two cost, has three willpower. The only problem with him is that if somebody swings back, he generally won't kill them. But then again, most of the things that swing back won't kill him because of his three willpower. So often he's a one or two turn trade, but he has the ability to take down something when he swings at it, which is really good for him. So most of the time you can take down one or two things before he dies in that early game, which is really, really useful to help slow down aggro or mid-range decks. He has a lot of usefulness, just like one drop captain. Unfortunately, right now there's no shift target for him, but who knows what we'll see. I think he's a solid B tier card. I almost want to put him into A tier, but I feel like he is a slightly worse captain for the reasons we went over earlier. So B tier is where I'm going to leave him, but he is almost an auto include in every deck, but not every deck. Up next, we have Simba, future king, one drop, inkable, two strength, two willpower, one lore generation. And when you play this character, you draw a card and then choose a card and discard it. So good way to drudge through your deck get to see a few extra cards, especially in the early game when you're searching for your grab your sword, smash, giant tank, things of that nature. This card is going to be a fairly decent option in a lot of your steel aggro decks like Amber Steel Songs, things of that nature. It is not an A tier card, I do not think. Currently, I think we're gonna leave it in the B tier. It's decent. It doesn't really stand out from the crowd, but it is played in a fairly decent amount of steel decks. So I, I think B is a decent option for it. We'll follow that up with Simba, seven drop, inkable, returned king with his four strength, six willpower and two lore generation. He has challenger four. And during this turn, this character gains evasive. So it's a decent counter to the Emerald Ruby Evasives deck, which we saw a little bit at the beginning of the first chapter. It looks like that has kind of fallen off from the meta right now. So with that being said, I think we're gonna put him as C tier. He could see a little bit of a bump when or if Evasives becomes a little bit more popular. But for right now, I think he's fine in C tier. He's a decent card, decent stats, but as a seven drop, there's probably better options for you. We'll go to the five drop uninkable Simba, rightful heir, three strength, five willpower, two lore generation. During your turn, this character banishes another character. In a challenge, you gain one lore. This is an archetype for a deck that I've really been playing around a lot with lately. Something like a Ruby Steel deck based on challenging for lore. 
there's a lot of decks that are running fairly decent characters that are exerting them quite often, leaving them exposed. And something like Simba, Aladdin, even TK, the Heartless, which we're going to talk about here in a second, could be fairly decent, especially when we see the next set of cards. But currently, with the way everything's stacked up, I think we're just going to leave him in C tier. I think he has a lot of potential coming into the next few sets, especially when paired with Ruby. But I'd like to see a little bit more options before we rank him any higher than C. Five drop Starkey, Hook's Henchman is a inkable card, five strength, four willpower, one lore generation. When you have a captain character in play, this character gets plus one lore. This is a interesting option. It will eventually probably see a little bit of play when we have a better pirate deck. But as of right now, there's not enough captain keywords to really utilize him properly. We do see a little bit of play out of some of the non one drop captain hooks. But other than the one drop captain hooks, which often leave play fairly early on after they're played, we're not seeing anything really stick around. And until that happens, Starkey will probably sit in the C tier along with the Simbas. TK Heartless, six drop, inkable card, five strength, five willpower, two lore generation. He's got decent stats for a six drop. Nothing really to write home about. During your turn, when you play this character, when this character banishes another character, you gain two lore. So similar to our five drop Simba, except he's inkable, which is great. So for that extra lore, you gain an additional two strength and an extra one lore when you challenge with him. So like I said, I'd really like to see a little bit more ability for you to be able to gain a lot of benefit out of this with something like Ruby. But until that really happens and we see something that can really drive this style of deck home, I think he again is going to sit in the C tier. There's just better options with stuff like Giant Tank, which we're going to talk about up next. So let's just get into Giant Tank. Giant Tank has become a very strong staple in this format. It is an incredibly powerful card with the ability to shift on four um, with a six cost inkable character, four strength, five willpower, two lore generation. Its ability to spread one damage across all opposing characters, so it's targeted removal, coupled with things like grab your swords, that's a massive amount of three damage going around the table. And then during your turn, it has the added ability when you banish a character in a challenge, you deal two damage to a chosen opposing character. The fact that this can target down non-exerted characters, things like a off Lilo that they play or things of that name, that nature, or basically adds up to three if you shift it on the same turn it's played because of the spread one damage is incredibly powerful. This is definitely a meta defining card and anyone who thinks it isn't I'm sorry, you're just wrong. This is an incredibly powerful card and probably one of the mainstays for the reason people are splashing steel right now. Incredibly powerful. I could not say more about that. The three drop tink, inkable, two power, sorry, two strength, four willpower, and one lore generation. The tiny tactician here can exert to draw a card and then choose to discard a card. So it's kind of like a built in one drop Simba's ability, except you can use it every turn by exerting it. Most people do not use this for the draw power. They use it because it is a shiftable character for giant tank. It can help you dredge through the deck and get into some decent cards if you're looking for answers, which is also excellent. And it's four willpower helps keep it on the board and away from those three power characters, especially the three power characters like Captain Hook, the um, Prince that challenge for three, just incredibly good to have that four willpower on board. I'm glad it's not a two, three because then it would probably not survive as much. But with the fact that it has four willpower, it can generally stay on the board a turn or two and then still be shifted from giant tank, which is a excellent option for it. I think it's a solid B tier 
card. There's nothing really to write home about it other than the fact that it is a shiftable target for Tinkerbell. All right, let's get into the actions. First up, we have a whole new world. This is a controversial card for a lot of people. Its ability to draw seven cards is incredible, especially if you utilize it when your opposing player has five to six cards in hand. When your opposing character gets down to one or two cards, it's kind of a feel bad moment because it's not inkable. You're basically giving them the same value and hoping for a better return. I've seen this penalize people a lot more than I've seen it help them. So I don't really know what to say more about this card. I honestly believe it is a B tier card. It helps you as much as you hurt you. And I think it is only really good in the hands of an incredible player who knows exactly when and when not to use it. Or you're really trying to press a deck with advantage like the Amber Steel Songs deck. I feel like it should be a B tier card. It's one of those cards that in an incredible player's hand, it can go all the way up to S tier because you can basically find ways to shut out your opponents incredibly by drawing those seven cards and making whatever they play not usable. But with our control meta going on right now, you could feed them into be prepared, grab your swords, things of that nature and heavy aggro matchups that could just stop you completely. This is probably going to be a very controversial pick on my list, but I almost refuse to run this card in most decks. And unless Mill becomes more powerful or there's more synergy in it, I think it's honestly a B tier card. It's kind of like a lot of the Sapphire ramp right now, where you just find that it's the only option and that's why people think it's good. But I think we're going to see this quickly replaced, hopefully, by abilities that can utilize it better. That being said, with Beast Mirror, like that we're coming into here shortly, being able to basically float between zero cards in hand and drawing off Beast Mirror and seven cards in hand so that you can empty out and flood the board and then draw with Beast Mirror is pretty good, but it's a lot of utilization and still filling your opponent's hand by a lot. So probably a controversial pick, but I'm gonna leave it here in B tier. You guys let me know in the comments what you think about that. I'm sure somebody's gonna roast me. It's totally fine. It's just my opinion on the card. Let's get into second action, which is break. This is a two drop inkable card that says banish chosen item. To my knowledge, this is one of two cards in the game that banishes items. One being the five drop beast that we talked about a moment ago. It might have some future play if we feel like there's a lot of items in the meta. Currently, I think you could actually run a few decks with them as four or five drops and just use them, or sorry, four, three or four copies and use them as just inkable cards, similar to how some people use other actions. But currently, because we have Beast as an option in this deck, and you generally don't see a lot of early turn items that are useful, Beast is currently just fine. More threatening one, one or two drop items will probably force this card to be seen a lot more in Steel. But for right now, I'm gonna put it here in the C tier. Next up, we have Fire the Cannons. This, to me, can actually be fairly decent. It's a one drop uninkable card, which hurts it a little bit, but it does do two damage for that one cost. So it's a great way to get rid of things like your Lilos, a lot of the decent two drops, the two strength, two willpower characters that a lot of decks have in the early game. If you're going for a very control heavy steel deck, if you're doing that, you'll probably see fire the cannons. You'll probably end up seeing the I believe it was the four drop Captain Hook that allows you to grab them out of your discard pile. But right now you're seeing it splashed a little bit. It's a decent value for one. So I feel it is a C tier card. It might go to B. I think it's C because you don't really see it played in a lot of decks and B generally means that it's played in a fair majority of our current meta, which I don't think it is. It's probably one out of the top five steel combinations you've seen it played, 
So I think C tier is fine for it. It definitely has some playability, not like D tier where it just doesn't see any play. And then we have Grab Your Swords. Grab Your Swords is a five drop uninkable card. It is a song which makes this card absolutely incredible. So you can use a five drop or for example, three drop out of Amber, Ariel to sing this song and give you incredibly value dealing two damage across the entire opposing board. This coupled with something like a shifted tink on turn four with the aerial can be incredibly powerful. Just dealing three damage across the board on turn four or five. Great, great value. I think we're definitely going to have to put this. I, I think it's S tier. I think the entire steel meta is designed around these two cards currently. And I don't think there's really any way around of not putting it in the S tier. There's a part of me that wants to put it into A, I think just because we've seen Resist come out for the next few sets. But until that card, those cards actually hit and we see how much of that is around, I think S tier is what this card deserves right now. Two drop Ransack. This is a two drop inkable card. Draw two cards, then choose two cards and discard them. This is a heavy cost for not gaining you any card advantage. But being able to pick the top two cards out of your deck have some playability, but we really are not currently seeing it in any deck in the format right now, which I think I hurts its viability. And if you're really needing to get this much through your, your deck, you're probably playing a very strong control, which I think is paired with something like Amethyst, where you can get a little bit of recursion off your big actions, which means you're probably having the card draw already to get through your deck. So I think, unfortunately, we have to put this as D tier. It might eventually float up into the C and B tier as Steel becomes a little more exclusive with what colors it runs with. But for now, I think a strong D tier. Smash. Smash is a three drop inkable card that deals three damage to chosen character. It is a very strong staple in a lot of decks. I do not think it defines the meta Therefore, I believe it is a A tier card. It is a great way to remove a lot of nasty options, especially when coupled like with things like Hans that allow four damage to hit a character instead of just being able to hit it with three and leave it sit around with an extra one damage on it. Or things like a Tinkerbell or grab your swords to get all the way up to five damage on a character. It's just an incredible option for removal. So, and it is inkable as well if you ever need to do that. There's a lot of great value in this card, and I think that's why most decks run four of them currently. Let's get into those items. Beast Mirror is something that is also seen a lot of increased playability in the current format. At the beginning of the expansion, a lot of people slept on this card, didn't use it at all, thought it was terrible because you'd never have zero cards in your hand because we always play a whole new world. But with how much people are not playing a whole new world and using Beast Mirror in the mid to late game in order to continually draw more, Beast Mirror has seen more and more playability. And the fact that it is three costs to draw that next card when you have zero in hand because of that minor stipulation when you need it the most, unfortunately, the three cost is much better than paying four for a Magic Mirror and using it whenever. Magic Mirror is still a better card because there is no stipulation on it, but this one is also inkable, so it gives you more options to do with the card. I think because Steel generally pairs with some pretty heavy card draw abilities, I think it's still a B tier card, but in poor color combinations with it, I believe it could move to A in specific decks, but I think it needs to stay here in B because it really just doesn't fit in every single Steel deck. It is not an auto include, which I think keeps it out of A, and it's definitely not defining the meta, so it doesn't go to S. But it is, I'd say, in a majority of steel decks, so it's going to stay out of C. So I think B is the perfect spot for it. The good old frying pan. The two-drop inkable item that says, banish this item, chosen character can't challenge during their next turn. Currently, with the meta the way it is, most people are trying to stop questing not challenging if we see that change we'd probably see a lot more play out of this 
which would make it a little bit more crucial in its viability. But for right now, it is a D tier card until we need to prevent challenging more. So that's really all we need to say about that. I'm going to skip our next one up, which is the Tabard, and go straight to the Plasma Blaster. The Plasma Blaster here is a three drop uninkable card item. Exert it, pay two, deal one damage to chosen character. The ability that this stays online has some usefulness. Unfortunately, with other options like Hans or at a reduced cost smash or at a reduced cost fire the cannons, I think hurts the viability of this card and is why we never see it in any decks or see any play. We'd have to see something that boosts damage done. If there's another item that says exert it, the next time you deal damage to a chosen character, deal an additional damage would make this very useful, which we might eventually see. But as of right now, I think paying two to do one doesn't really have the most viability, especially without something like ramp. Maybe in a Staffire seal item deck, we might see a little bit more viability out of this, but currently not so much. All right, the big topic for me, Musketeer's Tavern. So, I spoke a lot in this video on Bodyguard, the 4-drop Donald Duck, the 3-drop Hercules, the 6-drop Mickey. Now, while I do feel those are currently C-tier cards, I think this card particularly makes them all a little bit better. The big complaint about everybody when they talk about Musketeer cards or Bodyguard is that if you have too many, most of them act like they don't have it at all. I think what people miss out on that is when, for example, the deck that I'm currently tooling around with is a Amber Steel Bodyguard deck, where instead of running a lot of the hyper aggressive low options, it runs all steel bodyguards with a couple of staple cards in it, like Stitches, the seven drop for card draw, the three drop Ariel for singing, and a few other key options where having bodyguard on everything except those makes it so they can never truly hit those characters unless it was it's with something that's direct like a Dragonfire or Smash which gives them a lot more survivability. And when they're forcing to go through so many bodyguard characters that end up drawing you a card or even two if you have multiple tabards out is incredibly strong from what I've seen. I'd love to get more play with this deck, but currently there's a bug on Pixelborn where if you be prepared or have multiple out, sometimes you don't get all the cards you deserve, which is unfortunate because I'd love to get you guys a video for that. So I think I'm going to try again and see if they fix the bug. But having three or four bodyguards out and having one or two tabards out can easily accumulate multiple cards if an opponent like Amethyst Ruby performs a be prepared where you can draw anywhere from three to nine cards depending on or three to eight cards depending on how many tabards and bodyguards you have out which effectively nullifies any value that they gained off of performing that be prepared or dragon fire with a smash or just challenging low drops into your musketeers because grabbing a card off at every card with bodyguard that dies can add up very quickly. It's kind of scary how many cards I've had in my hand with the deck when playing it in real life. I really want to see the ability to be able to try it on Pixelborn for you guys. So that being said, I want to put a stipulation in on this card. I think currently in 90% of the decks, actually almost 100% of the decks, let's just say 100% of the decks in the format, this card is a D tier card, absolutely unplayable. In the deck that I think we're gonna see, hopefully, and definitely in later sets, this is a card to watch out for. It is unlimited card draw based on when your characters die, and especially in a board wipe heavy control environment, these bodyguard characters will automatically move up one tier at least, and Tabard will move up to an S tier card. Now, I know that's kind of a controversial thing, but we're gonna, I would really like to see somebody else try that and take it to a major tournament 
running all six of the bodyguards out of amber and steel and then have your value cards like Ariel, the singer and a fair amount of songs just like the one that we're, one we're running now because I currently have and I joke you not the ratio of win loss is a hundred percent versus amber ruby or sorry amethyst ruby i am undefeated against fairly competent players in every single game that i have played against amethyst ruby well that being said please let me know what you think about that let me know if you're going to try that deck out with the bodyguards and see how it runs i'd love to get that gameplay for you and please leave a comment. Let me know what you think of all this. And hey, you guys have a great rest of your day. Thank you for watching Illumineers. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and ring that bell to stay up to date on everything Larkana. See you on the next one.